So hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Dominika Domi, uh, and I'm a first time moderator, hopefully not the last one. I'm super pumped for, for today's meeting. Um, and today's presenter is going to be Sonia Lombroso, who is a Oh, sorry, who is a pharmacology PhD candidate uh, working under the mentorship of Dr. Chris Bennett at the University of Pennsylvania. And Sonia's thesis work focuses on the development of cell-based therapies for the treatment of neurological disorders. And most recently, Sonia, along with co-authors, engineered a human CSF1 receptor with inhibitor resistance that can be used to replace microglia without the requirement of chemotherapy or irradiation a finding that uh, we will hear more about today, which is, makes me very excited. Um, and Sonia, uh, beside that, is also particularly interested in understanding factors involved in microglial identity. She focuses on answering questions like, does cell origin matter to macrophage identity? as she believed that this type of questioning will be necessary uh, to create the next generation of cell therapies. So I will give it to Sonia right now and I'll like one uh, quick announcement. If you have any questions, please tape the, type them in the either chat box or raise a hand after the end of the, the talk and don't be shy to ask the question yourself. So Sonia, take it away. Thanks, uh, Dominika. And thanks so much for having me. Um, I gave this caveat before. Uh, my dog is being a little chaotic, so I apologize if you hear any background noises. Um, he's well cared for, I promise, just uh, needy. Um, so as, as was mentioned, I'm a graduate student um, at UPenn uh, in the Bennett Lab, where we are a new, uh, neuroimmunology lab, primarily studying microglia. And today I'm really excited to talk to you a little bit about um, this project in which we engineered an inhuman uh, CSF1 uh, receptor uh, to be inhibitor resistant uh, with the goal of replacing microglia. And so I want to um, start first with an acknowledgement slide um, specifically for this project because it was so collaborative. Um, it was a kind of a happy turn of scientific events uh, in which two labs, the Bennett Lab and the Blurton Jones Lab, were working on the same question um, and really uh, actually had a lot of the same answers. And so we ended up merging forces. And I think um, because of that, because of this collaboration, um, it's, an ex it's a good example of collaborative science in which our findings are much stronger because of that collaboration. Um, so in terms of uh, people to highlight, I wanted to highlight uh, John Paul, who's the uh, co-first author on this paper, as well as Graham Pete and Dave Marzan, who were researchers in the Bennett Lab who worked on this project uh, before I even got there. Great, wonderful. Um, so as, as mentioned, um, we'll be discussing kind of some work uh, from this paper recently published in Journal of Experimental Medicine titled Engineering an Inhibitor-Resistant Human CSF1R Variant for microglia replacement. And for a brief overview for how uh, I think today is gonna go. So I'm gonna give you a little background on microglia and what we think of as microglia replacement therapies. I'm gonna talk briefly about some models and tools you might not be familiar with. Then I'll get into um, basically our murine studies of this, these experiments um, and our human iPSC derived microglia studies. And then finally, I'll briefly summarize, talk about some future directions um, and I'd love to hear uh, questions and, and your thoughts on the work as well. So in the Bennett Lab, we like to start kind of every project and presentation with kind of a, a large overarching question. So here really the driving question is how can we improve cell therapies for brain diseases? Um, and we think um, that one way, uh, one cell in particular that might be well poised to answer this is, is microglia. And what, what are microglia? Well, they're um, early brain occupants that stem from yolk sac progenitor cells. They're the resident macrophage and primary immune cell of the central nervous system occupying about 10% of the brain. And microglia are dynamic and process bearing. And what I mean by that is that they have this really ramified morphology in which they form complex branches and offshoots that allow them to occupy a lot of space uh, in the brain. And so here I'm showing you uh, an image of microglia uh, stain for, uh, for IBO1, which is the pan macrophage marker shown in red, um, along with DAPI, which is a nuclear marker. And so um, all of these red cells are uh, brain macrophages. And what um, you can appreciate is that all of this black space um, is not actually just empty space. It's filled with other brain cells, such as neurons and glial cells and all, all sorts of things. So um, these microglia are really um, in the brain milieu um, and occupying a lot, of, uh, a lot of space there. 
And while microglia are often thought about in terms of their immune function, functioning like phagocytosis or clearance of cellular debris, they're also extremely specialized for other functional requirements of the brain in order to maintain uh, CNS homeostasis. And so some of these other functions are the ability to eliminate and remodel synapses, um, or even promoting uh, neural survival, or even eliciting uh, programmed cell death. And so microglia, healthy microglia kind of help maintain homeostasis, but upon inflammation and injury, microglia can adopt these kind of amoeboid uh, morphologies. Um, and, and while it's often not really well understood if these, uh, this morphology is causational or correlational, these disease microglia or microglia in diseases have, have been associated with many different types of diseases. Um, and so we're really interested in understanding if we can target certain um, uh, factors in these cells, if we can ameliorate some of these diseases. And so you can imagine that one way to do this is like a targeted approach. So just editing or, or, or targeting uh, one gene that's known to be dysregulated in these microglia and in disease states. But another approach is, is actually replacing this uh, dysregulated microglia in its entirety. And we kind of think about these things uh, in terms of, or call them microglia replacement therapies. Um, so if we can replace these um, disease microglia with healthy surrogates, perhaps we can ameliorate um, some of the symptoms or, or, or some of these diseases. And one particular uh, class of diseases that we think is really well poised to be addressed by this, these types of therapies is a, a class of diseases called leukodystrophies, of which uh, Crab A disease is one. And so Crab A disease is a severe neurodegenerative condition that's caused by deficiency in the GALC enzyme, which is an enzyme critical for the breakdown of um, toxic fats like cycosine and galactoseramide. Um, and in uh, humans, um, Crab A disease has an incidence rate about one in 100,000, and its symptoms include things like seizures and, and cognitive impairment um, and, and ataxia. And there's a range of severities, but in its most severe early onset form, uh, when left untreated, Crab A disease will cause death um, by two years of age. And, and there's no cure for Crab A disease. There's no known cure for Crab A disease. Uh, and, and there's only um, a treatment that is effective pre-symptomatically. And I'll talk a little bit more about this treatment in the subsequent slide. But in addition to um, this, uh, the cortical atrophy you can see in this, um, these uh, patients of, uh, sorry, MRIs of patients affected by Crab, Crab A disease, Crab A disease is also defined by um, reactive brain macrophages that have this altered morphology and increased lipid storage, which um, increases with disease progression. So here we're showing, um, we're looking at hematotoxin and eosin stain of a macaque uh, with Crab A disease. And I hope you can appreciate that the morphology of these brain macrophages is, is really different than the ones that I showed on the slide before. So these are very round. They have um, very few processes. They're, they're full of lipids. Um, and often they're they're actually multinucleated, and it's it's not the the role of these cells in the disease is not well understood. Um, it is not well understood, and so we this definitely needs more study to understand this. And so I mentioned um, uh, before. So uh, luckily for us, there's a there's a well validated mouse mouse model of Crab A disease called the Twitcher mouse, um, which arose from a, a spontaneous mutation that causes a truncated mRNA. Um, and if left untreated, um, these mice die around P35. And um, in the twitcher mice, you can see that they have kind of this failure to thrive. They, they, are, uh, they weigh a lot less than their wild type counterparts. They um, have basically these, this motor dis deficit in which you, they have this twitching behavior. Um, and with progression of disease, you can also see the hallmarks of, of brain pathogenesis as well. So there's an increase in uh, demyelination. There's an increase of cytokine production. Um, these are relative, there's very unhealthy mice. Um, that recapitulate disease. And as I mentioned before, there's, there's only a, a, a pre-symptomatic treatment for Crab A disease, and that, and that treatment is hemopoietic stem cell transplantation. Um, and while HSCT is beneficial if given uh, uh, pre-symptomatically, it has a couple caveats. The first being that pre-symptomatic for some patients means within the first several months of life. And the second is that in order to be effective, HSCTs depend on toxic preconditioning, such as chemotherapy and radiation. Um, and, and that's required to deplete the endogenous macrophage niches in order to get donor cells to engraft there. Um, and so this is toxic, not only during treatment, but also as many health complications uh, later down the line for these patients. And furthermore, um, the mechanism of action for HSCTs uh, in Crab A disease is not super well understood. I mean, there's still a lot of debate on this. One putative mechanism is the idea of cross-correction. So it's the idea that these, some of these healthy cells make their way to the brain, and they provide a functional copy of GALC, um, the enzyme that's dysregulated in this disease. 
um, and that ameliorates the lack of this enzyme in, in other cells. However, um, with this hypothesis, one, one caveat is that as it currently stands, even after irradiation and chemotherapy, donor cell engraftment is, is not particularly high in, in mice um, or in humans. And so here researchers um, varied either a pretreatment method, either using irradiation or busulfan, as well as donor cell delivery, either intravenously or intracranially. And what you can see is that even at the, the longest time point after stem cell transplant with the most kind of aggressive pretreatment and intracranial transplantation, the level of chimerism is, is still relatively low in, in this mouse model. And this has been corroborated by um, postmortem uh, human tissue of patients receiving bone marrow transplants. And so these researchers took advantage of sex mismatched donors in which female patients received male, uh, male bone marrow transplantations. And similarly, um, it, it was seen that while the relative number of host cells was depleted, the actual number of donor cells was, was still relatively low. And I don't mean to, to, to imply that cross-correction is the, the only hypothesis for how HSCTs work in crab A disease. Um, the Felfry lab and others have, uh, have uh, provided a lot of data that suggests that uh, the mechanism, uh, mechanism of action of macrophages in this disease is actually through other uh, functions, such as like phagocytosis. Um, but either way, um, if it's whichever hypothesis uh, ends up being true, either this idea of cross-correction or, or other macrophage functioning, the idea that um, if we could increase chimerism, that would increase disease, um, disease symptoms um, still remains. So basically the question is, how can we increase brain chimerism? So how can we increase microglia into the brain? And so we have a couple models in the field that we can do this. One is a genetic model. So you can genetically deplete microglia, and this is kind of picking your labs, your, your favorite flavor of genetic depletion. In our lab, we use a CX3 CR1 uh, Cree. Uh, crossed with a CSF1R flox flox. So in the brain, CX3, CR1, Cree should be primarily microglia uh, expressed, uh, and CSF1R is pr uh, primarily restricted to myeloid cells. So this allows for a pretty specific knockdown of microglia um, with tamoxifen treatment. In our lab, we uh, tamoxifen treat on P1 and P2. And at this point, so you're depleting the host uh, microglia shown in purple. At this point, these, these brains can basically, these mice can basically be used as in vivo incubators for whichever cell, uh, donor cell of interest. And so this could be um, monocytes, or it could be microglia, it could be other uh, macrophages of really any origin. Um, and then you can, uh, these donor cells uh, can engraft and fill the brain, and you can analyze uh, percent chimerism um, at later time points. And this uh, model has been really well validated in our lab by a postdoc, Carly O'Brien, uh, where she shows that um, she's uh, able to get, you know, over 85% of uh, donor cell engraftment in these mice. In addition to genetic models, we also have chemical and pharmacological models for, uh, for microglia depletion. So many researchers use whole bone marrow radiation paired with transplant. Um, and in these models, similarly, you get a widespread engraftment of donor cells. So you might ask, okay, so we have these two different flavors of microglia depletion. Why do we need anything else? Well, uh, genetic models obviously are not very translatable to human uh, uh, therapies. And um, chemical models for microglia depletion can often be toxic and um, are not tissue specific. And so in order to kind of add an additional um, tool to the arsenal of how to deplete microglia, we um, started looking at uh, ways to create uh, CSF1R inhibitor resistance. And so first, um, just kind of what is the CSF1R receptor? It's a, a tyrosine kinase receptor whose signaling uh, is required for macrophage survival. Um, in endogenously, there are two known ligands, CSF1 and IL-34, which combine to the extracellular um, CSF1 a part of the CSF1 receptor, um, which allows for uh, kinase cascades for cell survival. And researchers have taken advantage of this, this, this need for CSF1R signaling for survival by creating small molecule inhibitors that bind to the kinase domain of CSF1R and block this signaling cascade. Uh, and these uh, inhibitors, uh, one example, they're called Plexicon. You'll hear me talk about this a lot in this talk. Um, these small molecule inhibitors uh, have been shown to lead to massive uh, depletion of microglia. And many other people have shown this, um, and we have recapitulated this in our lab with a neonatal depletion model in which we show a dose-dependent depletion of microglia. And we do this through subcutaneous injections um, uh, from day of birth to whatever, really whatever time point you want. Um, and this depletion is also effective across many different brain regions. Okay, so we have this, this model, this pharmacological inhibitor of CSF1 depletes microglia. Well, why can't we just use that to replace them? 
Well, uh, two, two main regions, the first of which is that microglia have this really amazing ability to repopulate the niche after depletion. And so these researchers um, basically depleted microglia with Plex um, for 14 days, at which point they looked at repopulation by endogenous microglia at several different time points. And so what they're showing here is that the microglia are shown by these white dots um, represented of a CX3, CR1 expression, GFP expression. Um, and so at day zero, you can appreciate that um, the relative number of microglia has been you know, massively depleted. But then as soon as you get to three days post inhibitor cessation, you can already see an appreciable amount of rebounding or repopulation of these uh, endogenous microglia. And by day seven, you know, nearly the entire uh, microglia uh, niches is repopulated. And so while these inhibitors are, are really effective to deplete microglia, these microglia have this amazing capacity to repopulate. And I mentioned there's a second reason why CSF1R inhibitors limit um, ability to use them for um, re microglia replacement. And that's because if you can imagine, this inhibitor is blocking CSF1R uh, signaling on also uh, not only on endogenous microglia, but also on the, the donor cells, right? So it's also kill, it will also kill the donor cells if, it's, if the animals are continued to be treated. So from this, um, we hypothesized that if we could just create an inhibitor resistant CSF1 receptor, perhaps we could boost donor cell engraftment in the CNS. And um, to do this, um, we used a couple different tools, which I'll just briefly describe here, just because you might not be familiar with them. The first of which is a murine probe E cell line called BAF3s, um, which is dependent on RTK signaling for survival. And this line has been classically used to study RTK signaling previously, um, and what's really Cool about the cell line is that um, you can switch its uh, receptor tyrosine kinase dependency from IL-3 to other ligands and other RTK signaling pathways. So we switched this dependency from IL-3 to CSF-1 to study the effects of different uh, CSF-1 receptors on survival. Um, and the second uh, mouse model that we use are these ER HOXB8 macrophages. I'll refer to them as either HOXB8s or CIMs, which stands for conditionally immortalized macrophages. And these are uh, macrophage progenitor cells that are uh, kept in their progenitor state through um, viral mediated expression of OXB8. And these are really useful cells because they can be uh, made and from um, really any mouse line. So we make these um, cells from mouse models that lack CSF1R receptor called a CSF1R KO. Uh, and this mouse basically has no um, endogenous uh, CSF1R receptor. So we're able to transduce these cells so that they only express the human CSF1R variant. So that's very useful. Um, we've also shown that these, these CIMs are able to readily engraft in a uh, open brain niche. So here we're showing um, CIM engraftment in a um, CSF1R knockout host. So these uh, hosts ha have a brain devoid of microglia. And these cells are able to um, robustly engraft here and they adopt uh, microglial morphology as well as expression of IBO1. We also use iPSC-derived microglia, which I'll talk a little bit about how we made these lines uh, later on in the talk. Um, and then finally, one really interesting thing about the CSF1 receptor is that the murine receptor can uh, be signaled through either the murine CSF1 or human CSF1, but the human CSF1 receptor depends on human ligand signaling. So in order to study the human receptor, we need a mouse with a human ligand knocked in. So we have that mouse um, by itself. We also have it on our uh, mouse model of Krebs disease, as well as corresponding uh, immunocompromised lines, which are necessary for studying iPSC-derived microglia. Um, here is just an image of um, these HOXB8s, which can also easily be used in culture. They differentiate into uh, bone marrow-derived macrophage-like cells. So here's kind of our working uh, model of our hypothesis. So um, if we have an inhibitor on board, endogenous microglia um, cannot signal through the CSF1 receptor. This leads to host cell depletion. Then if we can transplant um, donor cells that have an inhibitor resistance to this um, plex, the small molecule inhibitor, these donor cells can preferentially engraft and, and not only engraft, but also expand um, and replace the host cells. And so in order to try, to try to figure out how we could make these inhibitor resistant receptors, we uh, profiled the crystal structure of plex bound to CSF1R receptor with a structural chemist and used this to identify potential residues for mutation. So here we're looking at the binding pocket um, with a few potential, potential residues called out. This is um, plex, plex shown in uh, magenta with um, the CSF1R receptor shown in gray. Um, and on the right, we're looking at the uh, binding pocket um, of 
a plex in, in the receptor with um, one specific mutation, the 795 position, and how um, steric hindrance at this mutation, either for alanine, cytosine, or valine, might disrupt the binding pocket of the kinase. So with this structural chemist, uh, we identified about 20 proposed mutations. And we then uh, generated target mutants um, by uh, transducing these mutants into BAF3s. We then performed IC50 curves um, with PLEX uh, inhibitor, and we found that one particular variant, G795A, conferred uh, resistance relative to other mutants as well as wild type. We then uh, moved this mutation into our murine macrophage line and performed IC50 curves, where we also concluded that G795A also conferred inhibitor resistance uh, in these macrophages as well. We wanted to test if G795A also conferred resistance in primary macrophages, so we transduced bone marrow-derived macrophages with the IRRs, um, the inhibitor-resistant receptor, and we saw also that this inhibitor resistance was, um, was able to occur in these primary macrophages as well. And important, importantly, using um, uh, endpoint data, we saw that um, these G795A expressing macrophages had similar growth profiles uh, in, in just the ligand only, as well as um, they were unable to grow without the presence of ligand. So there was no evidence for a loss of function here um, or ligand independent growth. So next, we wanted to test um, if G795A had an effect on kinase signaling, um, because basically we have shown that this receptor was uh, allowed for inhibitor resistance. But since G795A is a RTK, we wanted to see, does this affect um, some downstream uh, kinase signaling? So um, we to do this, we performed a pulse chase reaction where we differentiated G795A and wild type uh, expressing macrophages. And after differentiating, we, um, we serum starved these cells for four hours. Uh, in the presence of varying amounts of plex, and then added uh, after that four-hour period, we then washed away that the, the, that inhibitor uh, and provided ligand. And I'll first take you through um, the wild type expressing cells on the left. And so, uh, without the presence of inhibitor, these cells um, are not uh, able to um, activate the receptor. The receptor is not phosphorylated, um, and the downstream target ERK is also not phosphorylated. Now, when you get um, uh, presence of the ligand, you get activation and phosphorylation of that receptor and phosphorylation of downstream target ERK. Now, with the wild type cells, with any appreciable amount of plex added into the um, solution, you see uh, an aberration or a, a depletion of this activation of this receptor, as well as phosphorylation of downstream target ERK. Uh, and with the increasing concentrations of inhibitor, you see that this is maintained in these wild type cells. Similarly, G795A expressing cells um, are, are not, the receptor is not phosphorylated in the presence of no ligand. Uh, there's no phosphorylation of downstream target ERK without ligand. And as soon as you provide ligand, this receptor is phosphorylated and there's phosphorylation of downstream target ERK. Now, in contrast, G795A expressing cells uh, continue to show um, activation of the receptor and phosphorylation of downstream targets with continued uh, increasing levels of PLEX. You know, at really high concentrations of plex, this um, activation is, uh, is inhibited. So from this, um, we concluded that there's a normal functioning of human CSF1R receptor expressing cells, um, as well as um, G795A seem to not have any um, effect on uh, this one downstream target of this receptor. There's no obvious extra kinase activity without human CSF1R, which is a, a big uh, point as well. Okay, so to briefly summarize the first part of this talk, um, we showed that G795A confers resistance against CSF1R inhibitors when expressed in vitro and murine macrophages. Um, importantly, we saw that um, this uh, had, no, had no discernible gain or loss of kinase functioning in these macrophages. So our next question was, does G795A, a human CSF1R receptor, allow for preferential engraftment of murine macrophages in the CNS? And so just uh, one more piece of background here is that um, many in the field have shown that if you just do a transplant of macrophages, either bone marrow derived or, or, or true microglia into a non-depleted brain, you don't get a uh, replacement of, of microglia. And so we're just recapitulating that with the added piece of evidence that this is also true for these conditional immortalized macrophages. So you don't get um, engraftment in a non-depleted brain. And this is uh, with the presence of plex pretreatment or um, without that. Sorry, one second, my dog is being crazy. Let me just try to stop him and do what he's doing. Sorry about that. Okay, 
So um, where was I? Yes, so we um, show that these conditionally mortalized macrophages can only engraft in the open microglial niche. So next we wanted to see um, if we could get these uh, macrophages to engraft uh, in the neonatal brain. And so we used this neonatal depletion model in which we gave subcutaneous injections of inhibitor um, as well as uh, cell transplants at P0. And what we saw was really robust engraftment of G795A expressing macrophages, which was really exciting. We saw that this engraftment was dependent on G795A, so the G795A expressing cells engrafted, wild type cells did not. And we also saw that this was dependent on PLEX, so G795A macrophages couldn't engraft in the uh, non-depleted brain. Really importantly, we saw that these cells also persisted after we stopped inhibitor treatment. So when we took these animals off plex, these cells were uh, able to persist. And so here we took the animals off plex for seven days and then harvested them. And you can see that these, these cells, uh, donor cells are shown in, uh, GF, in green because they're GFP expressing. So these donor cells are able to persist. And what I'm uh, these call out here are, sh here are showing is that these G795A expressing cells, you know, adopt a very microglial-like morphology. Again, they're expressing IBO1. And in the regions that are not engrafted, we get repopulation of endogenous cells, but the regions that are engrafted with our donor cells, we get relatively low repopulation of endogenous cells. And we also showed that this engraftment wasn't dependent on uh, immunocompromised mice. So we were able to recapitulate this in immunocompetent hosts. Similarly, uh, it was dependent on G795A expression and also um, PLEX treatment. So G795A expressing cells do not engraft in the untreated brain. So since the neonatal brain is, is relatively more permissible than the adult brain, we also wanted to test if we could get these cells to engraft in the adult brain. And what we found was similar engraftment in the adult brain uh, with G795A and PLEX dependency. So in this model, it's a little bit different because they're, they're adults. So we pre-treat these animals uh, with PLEX, uh, PLEX diet for about 14 days prior to cell injection. We do these cell injections through stereotaxic transplants and then allow these cells to either engraft for 14 days, which is our on PLEX time point, or we, at this point, we either harvest the animals for um, our on PLEX time point, or we allow them to engraft for another seven days on our off PLEX time point. And we were really excited to see that um, on PLEX, um, these animals uh, had a significant engraftment of G795A expressing cells. Um, and the, again, these cells adopted a microglial-like morphology expressing IBO1. And importantly, uh, wild-type expressing cells did not engraft in these adults either. And then we saw after seven days after inhibitor treatment was stopped that these cells were really able to persist uh, and, and um, fill the brain niche quite well. So this is um, uh, callouts of uh, G795A expressing uh, hoxb 8 after seven days of uh, inhibitor cessation. And we also saw that these cells um, express both resident and ontogenic uh, markers. So um, these cells are able to express TMM119, which is a microglia specific or a brain macrophage specific marker. Um, and they also express MS4A7, which is a marker of peripherally derived macrophages. So just to briefly recap um, the murine macrophage experiments in vivo. So we were able to see that uh, G795A murine macrophages can engraft and expand in both the neonatal and adult brain. This uh, engraftment was um, done in a plex dependent manner um, and these cells were able to persist after the removal of inhibitor. So our next question is, okay, does G795A confer inhibitor resistance to human microglia? Um, so the next steps for us to test this, uh, uh, we in the Blurton Jones lab uh, basically introduced mutations into the human microglia, uh, human, into human microglia um, using a CRISPR Cas9 approach where we edited the endogenous uh, CSF1R loci um, and we created homozygous clones. And so, as I mentioned, this was done at UCI, uh, Irvine, and at, at Penn. Um, so, we now have two independently generated um, iPSC lines uh, harboring this mutation. These iPSCs um, then underwent hematopoietic differentiation using standard protocols. And then this is where you can, we can take two approaches. The first of which we can differentiate these cells into I microglia in vivo. And this is something that the Blur and Jones lab is really, really well versed in. And the other way we can do this um, is by transplanting these cells uh, as uh, uh, common myeloid progenitors into the mouse brain and kind of let the brain does what it does best and, and kind of uh, have, have it uh, induce uh, uh, microglia state in these cells. And as I mentioned before, um, because these are human cells, um, this is dependent on um, uh, immunocompromised mouse. So we use um, a RAD-L2 knockout mouse model here with the human uh, ligand knockout. 
Um, so this is uh, basically work that um, John Paul in the Blurton Jones lab did, where he um, saw that G795A uh, expressing IMRAC ganglia are resistant to CSF1 inhibition. Um, and he did this through uh, uh, time-lapse imaging um, of, of caspase activation. So basically, um, wild-type IMRAC ganglia, when exposed to uh, different types of CSF1 uh, inhibitors, show um, caspase uh, 3-7 activation, which are both activated during apoptosis. So there's a cell death occurring in the wild-type expressing cells in presence of inhibitors. Um, and this activation uh, was not seen in G795A expressing cells. And this is true for other CSF1 inhibitors as well. So um, there's a clear resistance to PLEX uh, of these G795A expressing cells, but our next question was, okay, they're resistant, but what's their, what's their gene expression look like? Is this really altering their gene expression? And so John Paul did um, bulk RNA sequencing on a wild type and G795A expressing microglia uh, in culture. And he found basically very few differences um, either at the whole transcriptome level or uh, at the microglia signature gene level at baseline. So these are, um, I'm microglia cultures. And at baseline, there's very few differences. And so the next question was, okay, well, what about in response to PLEX? And as expected, uh, wild type expressing cells have massive gene expression changes uh, in response to PLEX, whereas G795A expressing cells um, have actually no gene expression changes in response to PLEX. So um, they're very inhibitor resistant in that the inhibitor pres presence of the inhibitor does not change their transcriptional profile. So this was all done in vitro. So the next question is, okay, well, is this also true in vivo? And so John Paul transplanted these cells into um, host animals, where he then um, waited 60 days and then uh, re-harvested these cells and did a uh, whole transcriptome analysis using bulk RNA-seq and found that similarly, G795A and uh, wild-type expressing cells um, had a very similar transcriptional profile, uh, both on the whole transcriptome level and microglia signature gene. And then um, in, in vivo, you know, there were a, a few genes that were different. Um, there, there's about seven genes total that were different uh, between wild type and G795A expression cells in, in vivo. Okay, so next we wanted to see um, on, the, on the whole transcriptome level, it seems like there's not really an effect of expressing G795A on these cells. But what about in kind of, we know that microglia are really important in immune response. So what about in immune signaling? Is there an effect of expressing these cells on that? Um, so to do this, we, um, or John Paul uh, did transplants of these cells um, and then uh, allowed them to engraft for 60 days, at which point he exposed them to LPS, uh, these animals to LPS injections. And basically what he saw was that there was no difference between G795A expressing microglia and wild type microglia. So I'll take you through here. I'm just showing G795A expressing cells, but what we see is that upon LPS treatment, there's a downregulation of IBO1 and p 12 that's a, known in the field. There's also an upregulation of CD45 as well as uh, MX1, which is a interferon response gene. So these G795A expressing microglia are responding uh, very similarly to LPS um, as wild type microglia. And so you might ask, okay, well, what are, what are wild types uh, human cells look like when they're transplanted into the brain and what's their, uh, what happens to them when you transplant them? So John Paul transplanted wild type expressing microglia into these, um, into these animals and showed that with no treat, so uh, I'll just uh, orient you a little bit. So here we're having um, brain slices in which we're looking at IBO1, which is a pan macrophage marker shown in green and KU80, which is a human nuclear marker. So KU80 will be marking any human cells, whereas IBO will be marking any macrophages in general. Um, and so with no treatment, what we see is that the human cells kind of are basically localized to the site of injection. Uh, the wild type cells are localized to the site of injection, but as soon as you start increasing, uh, or as soon as you start providing PLEX, as early as 10 days, you see a real depletion of not only these murine macrophages, but also these wild type expressing human iPSCs derived microglia. And by 30 days, you see basically a complete reduction of any brain macrophages, murine or uh, wild type. And that's true for 60 days as well. Okay. But what about G795A? Well, we saw that G795A iPSC-derived microglia were able to fully replace the endogenous microglia. So similarly, uh, upon no treatment, the cells were localized to the site of injection. After 10 days of treatment, however, you can see that these cells are starting to expand from the site of injection, whereas the murine macrophages um, are being killed. By 30 days, you can see that there's a persistence of these human cells, and they're not only persisting, but they're um, proliferating and expanding. You can see that they're like, filling most of the brain niche by 30 days. And by 60 days, they fill, fill the entire brain niche. 
Importantly, we also showed um, that these cells uh, persist after the removal of inhibitors. So these animals were treated for 30 days with the inhibitor and then taken off the inhibitor for 30 days, um, at which point you can see that these cells also engraft um, throughout the whole brain. And then also we're just showing, um, this is done uh, in the Bennett lab where we showed that the human microglia, um, we transplanted human microglia at P0, allowed them to engraft for 60 days and then flex treated these animals and showed that um, they fully uh, replaced the murine um, macrophages. Here we're looking at human CD45 by murine CD45. And so human cells will fall uh, within this gate and the murine cells will fall here. We also recapitulated the G795A microglia brain engraftment with our iPSC derived uh, line, showing that wild type cells do not engraft. Um, by 30 and 60 days, there's, there's a lot of brain engraftment, and then these cells do persist uh, similarly uh, off plex for us as well. So, just in summary of the G795A engineered human macrophage studies, um, we saw that G795A microglia have normal gene transcription compared to wild type microglia at baseline. Uh, the transcriptome of these G795A expressing microglia is not altered in the presence of CSF1R inhibitors. G795A and wild type microglia have similar protein response into, to LPS, one immune signaling um, paradigm. And engineered human um, microglia engraft robustly uh, when expressing the G795A mutation, um, but not wild type expression. And that these G795A expressing human microglia um, persist even after the removal of inhibitor. So um, just broadly concluding um, the talk so far, so we found that G795A substitution in the CSF1R receptor confers resistance to CSF1R pharmacological inhibitors without a discernible uh, gain or loss of um, uh, gene expression or kinase functioning. These G795A murine macrophages and human microglia engraft in an inhibitor-treated dependent manner, inhi inhibitor-dependent manner, um, and that these uh, both G795A murine expressing macrophages uh, and human macrophages persist even after the removal of inhibitor. So we're really excited about this work, and there's a lot of future discussion uh, about directions, and I would love to hear you know, what the audience thinks. Um, some things that we think could be like directly targeted is, is returning to that question of Crab A disease, um, using um, this tool to basically provide a functional copy of Gal-C to, um, to these animals and see how that affects crab A disease. That's something we're actively working on. But more broadly, you could use these cells to really payload delivery for any range of neurodegenerative disease diseases. One that comes to, mi comes to mind is obviously Alzheimer's disease, but I'm really interested to hear how the field thinks about um, this tool in, in this regard. And then finally, one thing that I think is really interesting about this tool is, is regardless if you think it will work to deliver a payload or not in disease setting, it'll be really critical um, to study the role of human microglia in a wide array of neurological disorders um, via humanized mouse models. So you can really study now without irradiation, without chemotherapy, how human cells respond um, to uh, immune signaling, but also just diseases in general. Perfect. Um, so again, Thanks. just just one more time at the end of the slide. Thanks again to my co-author John Paul, um, and really the entirety of the Bennett Lab um, and the Blair and Jones Lab. Um, uh, Mariko Bennett was integral uh, to this project as well, as well as um, Robert Spitali as well. Uh, my funding sources and just stop on this slide here. Thank you so much, Sonia. It was really great presentation. Um, very intimidating amount of data, I have to say, but uh, great to great to um, get to know this model uh, more. So I encourage people to put their question in the chat or like raise their hands. Um, I personally, okay, so we have one person that raised a hand. Uh, Delancer, do you want to ask your question or? Yes, hello. Uh, Sonia, thank you so much. This is an incredible work and I'm like really enjoying reading every piece of it and the listening is also amazing. Oh, thanks I'm, so much. I hope my dog wasn't too distracting. <laughs> no, not at all, not at all. I was just wondering, like after you uh, implanted the human microglia into the mouse brain, I was just wondering if you, if you guys like check any changes in the microenvironment in the brain, like such as like any changes in the cytokine, chemokine levels, yeah, or the, like the any immune interactions with other cells like T cells and Ks or yeah. like the monocytes. No, it's a really great question. And uh, aside from the LPS studies, we haven't done any profiling, so that definitely remains to be to seen what what's happening there. I mean, 
yeah, I think it's a, a great question and, and definitely future research needs to be done there. Thank Thanks. you. Thanks so much. Um, while waiting for other questions, I have actually two questions myself. Uh, right. One is a very broad one and one is a very specific. Um, you wrote in your paper that, however, future studies should finally map the consequence of the mutation on, on the cells, on the CF1R signaling, donald cell longevity and microglial function. So that's my first question. First question is, are you doing any more research experiments towards yeah. that? And yeah. do you find any differences in the, how the cell be, cells behave with that, that mutation that you introduced? Yeah, so we we haven't found any other differences um, aside those aside from those few genes that we reported um, in the okay. paper. Um, I think, as I as I meant as as in the paper we mentioned um, more broadly understanding how these cells um, have altered if they have altered responses in in immune signaling is is really important. I think so. We showed um, IHC data from after LPS, but um, right now we're in the pipeline is is RNA sequencing after LPS to yes. have a broader uh, understanding of what's <clears throat> happening on the transcriptome level of these cells um, and immune uh, response. So LPS is one thing that comes to my mind, but other models of, of demyelinating diseases and kind of more complex um, neurological disorders and diseases, I think uh, will be really pertinent here. So um, we could use the Cupazone model um, for demyelination and kind of uh, to, to kind of investigate if the functions of these cells are similar to wild type, uh, wild type cells. I think that would be really critical. And yeah. yeah. Amazing. Um, I will have one short question and then I will give great. it to Anne. Um, you said that also the other lab created the CRISP a CRISP uh, Cas line with the into introduced mutation. So I want to ask if the clones are isogenic, so with the same genetic background, or if not, whether you see the differences between those clones that the both lab uh, generated, basing on the genetic background of the uh, of the cells. Yeah, so in the paper, we only included the cell line um, from the Blurton Jones lab. Okay. Um, so I think future, we'll have to do future studies to compare these two cell lines. I think that will involve basically us shipping our cells to each other um, to really do some further studies on, on that. I think, um, yeah. That's Perfect. Fine. Thank you. And um, I'm giving the, the question so to much you right now. Hi, Sonia. Thanks for the talk. It was really great. Um, and I had a question about in terms of human treatment, would you still need to do a depletion protocol before treatment? And like, what kind of side effects might that have yeah. on a human? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, short answer is yes, there'll still need to be a depletion in order to um, deplete the microglia niche. Um, and Plex is actually used in the clinical setting already to deplete um, microglia and uh, macrophages in patients. Um, but it's a really great question is like, what is the effect of prolonged Plex exposure um, on, on humans and on, on mouse bodies. From mouse models, we know that um, it does, prolonged Plex exposure does have um, some effects. It, I think it affects um, OPC cell number, although it didn't affect um, oligodendrocyte cell number, it, it does seem to have an effect on OPCs. Um, so that's a, a really important question. I think um, kind of understanding what what is the minimum uh, amount of depletion that we can use in order to use this uh, inhibitor resistant receptor would be a very important uh, question in my mind to answer. Um, and then kind of furthermore, talking about like how this works in, in humans in general, is, uh, one thing that maybe someone will ask this question, but something that comes to my mind is like, is this even a, a, a useful technology for treating things like Alzheimer's disorder disease? So we know that like that there's so much pathology in that brain and actually mouse models has, have shown that um, in many AD models, um, mouse models, as well as um, tauopathy models, microglia are actually um, more resistant to pharmacological inhibition or in, uh, depletion. And so kind of using this model to, to, to study that a little bit more, I think will be really pertinent here. And, and then finally, I'll just also add um, one other th thought is that if we're transplanting these, these healthy surrogate cells into a brain that's completely messed up, what's gonna be the response of these cells to that brain environment? And, and I think that's gonna be something that needs to be studied on a disease by disease basis. Um, so lots, lots of work to be done still uh, to look at this in different disease models. Awesome, thank you. Thanks, Anne. Uh, we have uh, one question from uh, Tejbir. Thanks for a great seminar. Do you know by what mechanisms do the engrafted human microglia expand in the mouse brain? Uh, if yes, do they undergo proliferation or 
Yeah, um, so we know that they are actively proliferating at um, the basically, if you remember in those images I kind of showed you, there's like a, a very obvious border of the human um, iPSC derived cells. And we did some staining there um, to show that um, those cells that are on that border, it's kind of like you can imagine it being a wall of expansion. Those cells are uh, KI67 positive, so they are actively proliferating. Um, beyond that, um, I'm not, we're not really quite sure of the mechanisms. I think it's a really interesting question. Um, it's also a question that can be answered with, with other mouse models like um, of, of microglia depletion, like genetic mouse models, um, which is something we're also actively uh, working on in the lab. Sure. Um, next question from Du. It is fascinating work. Uh, microglia play complex role in both detrimental and protective directions in AD brains. Uh, can therapeutic implantation of IMGL or monocytes in AD patients also play a confounding role in disease progression? Any speculation? Yeah, I think it's a great question. And something I think I alluded to previously is that, you know, um, there are some diseases in which I think you see a clear benefit of this tool. So when you're, if it's a monogenic disease in which you can just provide the missing enzyme or any other payload, pay, payload that like can compensate in the brain environment. In terms of more complicated disease, diseases like AD, I think it, it, it does get more complex, right? Because you have a brain environment that might be messed up in, in many ways that are kind of causing the dysregulation of the microglia cells themselves. And so if it does replacing these dysregulated microglia with healthy surrogates, will that just lead to further dysregulation of those cells, uh, of those donor cells? I, I'm not, I'm not sure. Um, definitely something to, to think about. Um, question from I'll also, Yeah. So I'll sorry. also add yeah. um, another way I think that this tool could be used um, in terms of AD is people are making CAR macrophages already to target AD. So um, this tool could also be used as a way to kind of really engraft those um, CAR, uh, CAR macrophages. And, and our lab's definitely working on that art as well. Perfect. Um, question from Benti. Thank you for a great talk. What about the perivascular microphages? Uh, do you also deplete them? And what about the repopulation? That's a great question. Um, so we in this paper did not look at um, repopulation of perivascular macrophages. In genetic models in our lab, uh, explicitly the CX3CR1, CSF1R, flox, flox animal, we do see uh, repopulation of um, meningeal macrophages. Um, I think further validation and further studying will definitely have to be done um, in this model to know if um, plex depletion with uh, inhibitor resistant expressing cells uh, replaces those, um, those cells. I will say um, in a very uh, like N of one experiment recently, we have seen that these um, cells are able to migrate pretty far, far down the spinal column, um, but that doesn't really speak to um, replacement of perivascular macrophages. Perfect, we have many questions rolling. So I'm gonna give it to Jerry and then I think we can take one more or two more questions. Thank you, that was a great talk. I have a naive question about microbial de 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 depletion. So plaques induce apoptotic, apoptosis of microglia. I'm um, just wondering what cell types are responsible for cleaning up the debris if all microglia are gone. So one possibility is probably astrocytes, and that related to my second question: uh, What do, how do astrocytes respond to microglial uh, depletion and repopulation in your model? Thank you. That's a really phenomenal question. So basically, the question is: Is how are how are other brain types really really astrocytes responding to depletion via plex and repopulation with these cells. And short answer is we don't, we don't know. Um, we definitely need to look into that. Um, yeah, that's all I can say is that we really don't know. Um, yeah, a really, really great question though. This is a fairly new model. So it's like a lot of stuff that needs to be done, but it's also very exciting because also it opens a way to like multiple avenues of research, which actually that's what makes it so exciting about this, this study. A question uh, from Girl. Thanks for a great study and talk. Is this study could be improved transplanting yolk sac macrophage precursors instead of hemopoietic precursor cells? Yeah, that's a, it's a really good question. Um, so kind of the, to rephrase the question, should we go earlier in, um, in kind of cell identity? Should we be replacing with yolk sac cells? Uh, potentially, I mean, we could also just try transplanting that, see what happens if we transplant the iPSC line that's expressing the inhibitor resistance receptor. Um, so just some background on this question. Um, microglia, I mentioned really briefly that they have unique origins to other macrophages. So 
Microglia stem from yolk sac progenitor cells in the mouse model. They're seeded around embryonic day 7.5, whereas other um, tissue resident macrophages and peripheral organs are seeded um, by later stages of hematopoiesis. And um, interestingly, those other populations are often continuously replaced by bone marrow derived macrophages. Um, and uh, Chris has shown, uh, Chris Bennett has shown um, that you can take those peripherally derived macrophages and transplant them into the CNS and they become very microglial-like. They upregulate about 95% of microglial identity genes, um, but they still don't get to that 100% of microglial identity. And so the question remains kind of, does that matter? Is there a functional difference be be between those um, ML, um, uh, between those peripherally derived macrophages and, and bona fide microglia? And I think jury's still out. Um, but it's a good point is should we be going towards like yolk sac progenitor cell uh, for transplants? And I think um, for some of our, our murine work, murine macrophage work, I think that's definitely um, the direction that we're going towards. Um, we are, uh, Kelsey, a graduate student in the lab is trying to make Hox B8s from um, yolk sac progenitor cells. So that's kind of um, tackling that question a little bit. Great, great talk, Sonia. Thank you so much for for talking to us today. Um, and thank you so much for everyone joining the seminar today. If we have no, oh, two participants raised their hands. So Shruti, if you wanna ask a question. Yeah, hi, uh, thanks for the seminar, Sonia. Um, I was just wondering about the effect in the brain uh, during the time period when there is no microglia, like when you deplete and then engraftment, between that there is no microglia in the brain, right? So how long does it take and what's the effect in the brain? Sorry, what was the last little bit of that question? How long does what? How long does it take, like for the between the depletion and the engraftment? What's the time period? Yeah. And um, what is the effect on the brain if there is any? Right. Yeah. So it's a great question. Um, so in our genetic models, as I mentioned, we're depleting at P1 and P2, which obviously you're depleting microglia in a really important time in development. We're also kind of doing that with this PLEX model, right? So we're depleting um, at early development time points while we're doing these transplants. We haven't fully studied the effect on the brain. Um, what I will say is um, from the Green Lab has done studies in which they um, have uh, depleted uh, microglia using PLEX and shown that um, they're able to repopulate um, after seven days. So at least endogenous microglia are able to re fully repopulate the brain after seven days. Um, in terms of our, uh, our model, in terms of repopulation, um, the earliest we looked here was 14 days after transplant. And we do see uh, the, uh, we see the engraftment that I showed, which is pretty significant engraftment. What's the effect of not having microglia during development? Probably, probably something. Um, that being said, uh, the really interesting and useful part of this tool is that you can actually do this in adult animals, right? So you can kind of mitigate the effects of not having microglia on development by flex treating adult animals and, and, and doing transplants then. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sonia. Um, so Jerry also posted here um, and was about the seminar happening um, on January 31st. If someone wants to be a moderator, it's highly appreciated. Thank you one more time, Sonia. That was a great meeting, great talk. And thank you everyone for joining.